Hello and welcome to the Gist on Strat News Global. Hi, I'm Surya Gangadharan. India's space program is over 50 years old. Yet it's only in the last uh, recent uh, days that we have a space policy. So I'm cutting to the chase and uh, referring to my guest, uh, Chaitanya Giri, who is here in Pune. Uh, Chaitanya, welcome. Thank you, Surya. Uh, Chaitanya, the new policy sets out a vision, India's vision for space. Um, exactly what is this vision and why does it come so late in the day? So as you rightly pointed out, Surya, uh, this policy document was long in the works and uh, it's been, what, 60 years since the onset of the Indian space program, but we haven't had a document of this sort made public. And there's a reason for it. For a very long time, the Indian space program was working entirely under the ambits of the government. And although a policy document might have existed in the past entirely for the internal governmental consumption, but a document which has been made public did not exist. And the reason for that was that it was a government-run program. Uh, the doer, the operator, uh, the resuscitator of the entire program was the government and uh, the private sector was uh, playing a second fiddle on this while. Second fiddle, as in uh, whatever is needed by the government or the National Space Program, that was assigned to a, a paltry few uh, space contractors. And these contractors used to offer uh, ISRO with the necessary manufacturing capacities. The, uh, the private sector was not into, uh, into IP generation. They were not generating any new intellectual property. They were not into R&D but they were merely supplying whatever was required by the Indian Space Program to the T, to the last design dot that has been mentioned in, a, uh, in the design document. So, uh, a policy document which was, far, uh, which was overarching uh, the entire Indian landscape was missing. But cut to, if you come to the past 10 years or so, you have seen that the Indian government has been promoting uh, startups in the private sector, the participation in R&D, as well as in generation of novel uh, technologies that could be commercialized. And uh, they have been encouraging all that. And uh, after the 2020 space reforms, you've seen that uh, the government is very much keen to take the private sector on board and give it an equal status uh, to the, uh, the space agency, which is ISRO. So what you find now is a document which caters to the entire ecosystem. And when I say ecosystem, I mean that there are multiple stakeholders now. So the government is not the only stakeholder, but there are stakeholders in the uh, startups, there are stakeholders in the MSNEs, there are stakeholders in the large corporations, the banking sector, or uh, there are other ministries who are uh, very much uh, requiring uh, some direction from the space space assets in terms of their operations. So, for instance, I can tell you that Agriculture Ministry is very much interested in using Earth Observation satellites for increasing the agricultural output and whatnot. Then you have uh, the Ministry of Earth Science, which has been using uh, uh, satellites uh, for meteorological purposes, but these meteorological uh, applications now need to be commercialized. So, uh, you have multiple stakeholders now, uh, not all of them are from the government and to give them some sort of clarity, to give them some sort of vision for the next few years at least, uh, the go this government has come up with uh, a policy document mm -hmm. and this policy document has justice uh, to their stakes in the Indian space program. So, Chetanya, is this also an acknowledgement by the government that uh, you need to bring in the private sector because perhaps ISRO, uh, being a government entity, lacks the flexibility of, uh, you know, uh, responding to the market. And you need something which is far more agile and, uh, you know, uh, forward-looking. Yes, yeah, so if we, once you have multiple private entities uh, being uh, as part of the National Space Program, it definitely gives you the agility. Uh, uh, but what we've seen in the document, 
there is now clear demarcation of who's doing what. Mm -hmm. So there are clear tasks that are being assigned to the private sector. There are tasks now being assigned to ISRO, NSIL, in space, and these are very clearly demarcated. You know, if you, you if you've seen ISRO in the past uh, 10, 15, or 20 years, you might have come across ISRO doing a lot of multitasking. Yeah. So uh, they. They, they were building, they were operating, they were commercializing, they were the consumers of a lot of commercial technologies and so on and so forth. Whereas the core mandate of SRO, and it is in the name itself, it was research. Yeah. And okay. that was getting effect. The government took cognizance of uh, this particular fact that SRO needs to focus again on uh, R&D. And this is what they've clearly uh, stated in this particular policy document. So ISRO now has been tasked to only look after R&D and give away uh, a, any technology or any platform or any service that is uh, that has achieved commercial readiness. And to facilitate that transfer of technology from ISRO to the private sector, you have entities like NSIL, the New Space India Limited being created and uh, commercialization would happen through that route. At the same time, ISRO is also uh, a custodian of a, a massive amount of R&D and testing infrastructure, uh, which you see uh, them in all the ISRO facilities. Now, uh, this R&D and testing infrastructure was entirely used by ISRO for its own purposes. But what the government now intends to do is offer this infrastructure to private sector companies. Now, that has also been clearly enumerated in this policy document that uh, it is the in, uh, in space, the Indian National Space Promotion and Authorization Center, uh, which is a new agency, a sister agency of ISRO. Now, this agency has been tasked to uh, be the uh, sort of mediator between the private sector and its access, its required access to the ISRO facilities. So, uh, there is a lot of clarity uh, that is emanating from this particular document and uh, a lot of takeaways for all the stakeholders. So what about the Department of Space? What does it do? Does its role change uh, substantially? So the role of a Department of Space doesn't change much, but it, it gets clearly again uh, earmarked what they are going to do. So, uh, they, uh, so Department of Space is not the space agency, but it is the overarching body that looks after InSpace, NSIL and ISRO. Uh, they will be looking after the policy aspects. They'll see to it that this particular policy is implemented to the T. Uh, that the tasks that are earmarked for ISRO, NSL and uh, in space are fulfilled. Uh, whatever has been promised in the policy document uh, is uh, achieved. And uh, they will be the arm of the government that will take the Indian space program overseas. Uh, let's say for instance, uh, we recently had two major catastrophes, one in Turkey, the massive earthquake in Turkey, yeah. and let's say the volcanic eruption in Tonga. So in, in scenarios of disaster uh, mitigation and management, uh, and when India really takes pride in being the first responder uh, to faraway places, uh, India would want to use this kind of technology for uh, offering uh, aid and assistance when it comes to disaster. So DOS will sort of coordinate between uh, uh, the 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 R and D agencies, uh, the, the NSIL, the InSpace, and the Ministry of External Affairs to facilitate such sort assistance uh, during the times of crisis. Mm -hmm. Also, when there are no crises, uh, India would want to use these sort of entities. Uh, uh, so when I say these sort of entities, I mean the the private sector and uh, the public sector as well to benefit by offering a technology cooperation to developing countries. Again, uh, India takes pride in being the voice of the global south. And when you are voice of the global south, you have these added responsibilities of um, assisting countries to come up uh, uh, on socio-economic uh, metrics. So space uh, technology is something that will be deployed in a big way. And the Department of Space will play a very big role in offering technologies that we have to go abroad and do the magic. I presume uh, this will enable, uh, as you mentioned, uh, it will enable ISRO to focus on R&D. 
So as of now, uh, where does ISRO stand in terms of uh, IPRs and all that? Has it uh, you know, been able to break through that uh, uh, technology uh, gap or uh, challenges? So this is something, this is an observation that I have written in one of my previous research papers. Uh, so if you look at the patent office of India, and uh, let's say for the year 2017, 2018, you will find that ISRO had filed at that point in time only 14, one four mm -hmm. patents uh, with the Indian Patent Office. And that number is abysmally low, uh, especially for an agency uh, that we so look up to. Now, by emphasizing that ISRO is only going to focus more on R&D, which was not the case in 2017 and 2018, uh, we should expect that the number of uh, uh, patents filed from ISRO laboratories will increase tremendously. I also would like to congratulate uh, the Department of Space because internally they have taken a lot many steps to increase their R&D footprint. So they have set up new incubators uh, in uh, different regions of the country. So you will find new space incubators uh, coming up in National Institute of Technologies, in various central universities, state universities. And this will have a multiplier effect in terms of the IP that is generated. So a lot of academia industry interface, a lot of academia ISRO interface, uh, a lot of ISRO industry interface is going to cumulatively bring a, a massive churn in the number of uh, patents that are filed. And we are not here only about talking about the number of patents but it is also about the quality of mm, patents yeah. because a country like India which is now to become perhaps the second or the third largest economy on the planet we have to really up our game and when I say up our game I, what I mean is we have to focus on uh, increasing the quality of our patents and make sure that whatever IP is generated is getting commercialized really fast because that, that then has trickle down effects on the quality of employment that you generate on the GDP numbers and also on the next generation uh, you know indices that will surpass GDP so it could be happiness index or whatnot hmm. so uh, or overall uh, uh, human development index so we want to make sure that uh, ISRO plays a major role in uh, achieving these you know intangible uh, goals. So there are a lot of expectations and with ISRO giving the R&D charge fully, uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, we'll see a really positive difference in the next uh, six to seven years. So just as a matter of interest, uh, what would you say are the areas where uh, we can expect some breakthrough from ISRO? I know there's been the reusable launch vehicle and all that, but uh, for our lay viewer, uh, what are the key, um, you know, uh, R&D breakthroughs you expect to see say in the next 10 years or 5 years or whatever? So if, in terms of breakthroughs, we'll have to classify them as two types of breakthroughs. One is a national breakthrough because we haven't attempted that sort of technology before. So I, I'll categorize Gaganyan, which is the human space flight program into that category. Because the technology has been demonstrated elsewhere, we haven't done so. So it's a breakthrough for us. But then we also need to uh, qualify for global breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. So as in technology that hasn't been achieved anywhere, we should be aiming for that. Because if you look at our next door neighbor, China, uh, it has very clearly, you know, differentiated between what is to be achieved uh, to compete with uh, uh, other competitors, uh, especially they consider the US as its competitors. And what sort of uh, technology should we go for to completely dominate the tech landscape or the economic landscape? So we'll have to sort of uh, make those two kind of categories. So Gaganyan will be a national achievement, but I don't think it's an international achievement for us. For us, international achievement would be, uh, let's say, uh, sort of putting a human on the moon and keeping that human... I mean, letting him or her stay over there for, for long durations. Mm -hmm. So long duration uh, space presence is something that we should be looking at in a big way. Then uh, uh, using uh, innovative communication systems for Earth-Moon communications 
so going over uh, radio frequencies going over uh, electromagnetic spectrum can we can we look at quantum communications uh, to happen between the earth and the moon can we use uh, lasers uh, as communication so these are the variety of technologies that we should be aiming at can we can we can we bring about uh, some breakthroughs in longevity longevity research longevity as a human longevity can we extend our lifespans uh, well beyond 100 years although it's not 100 years even <laughs> now <laughs> can we really do that so these sort of you know technologies or these sort of sciences is something that i am expecting from isro are these easily shared uh, by uh, the world leaders in um, you know uh, such technologies certainly not these are not easily shared because uh, if it really has commercial value then people or countries would want to keep uh, these sort of technologies really guarded and close to their hearts and we'll have to learn lessons from there how how uh, you know how danveer as we say here hmm. in uh, india how open hearted should we be when it comes to sharing of technologies of course uh, india is expected to be uh, you know a giving country it will give a lot but yet at the same time you shouldn't be giving a lot uh, in a way that you are uh, at a disadvantage yeah yeah so we should share advantage then we should also not share at an at our own advantage this is something that we have to be really clear about uh, as we proceed in the coming years mm -hmm. uh, i find that there is no mention of defense in the uh, vision document i mean is that deliberate it it could be deliberate so this is my assumption but there is a mention of uh, security in the uh, in the policy document where uh, the aim of this policy uh, as has been mentioned in the document is uh, to make sure that the country progresses economically and its uh, security concerns are also taken care of uh, but when when you mean security it can be any security yeah. it can be economic security human security and what not uh but when it comes to pinpointedly at defense uh what we can expect is that there could be another document in the making so i'm not sure about this i haven't been told but if you look at an exemplar that is coming out of uh, the united states so uh, back in 2020 uh, when uh, president trump was at the very end of his tenure in december 2020 the Americans released a space policy document, which was their national space policy. And if you look where that national space policy is placed, it is placed on the website of US Department of Commerce. Hmm. Okay, that document really takes care of a uh, uh, lot of aspects, including defense, because in the American context, uh, the Department of Defense is one of the biggest benefactors of the American space program. Uh, uh, its contribution in terms of allocation of contracts uh, are humongous and they are second to none. So, clearly defense is mentioned uh, in the space, uh, space policy document of the Americans which is placed on their Department of Commerce. But, at the same time, there is another document which is placed on a DOD website, a Department of uh, Defense website, which is called uh, the national space uh, national security space strategy so there is a, a strategy document uh, which which is completely different and that is for the consumption of largely of dod and pentagon we might or we should be expecting a similar document uh, coming up from our ministry of defense given the fact that the ministry of defense has its own defense space agency and this defense space agency has its uh, very peculiar requirements uh, in the coming years. The Defence Space Agency will be one of the biggest uh, benefactors of the commercial ecosystem that we are talking about right now. And uh, there will be contracts flowing in from ISRO, there will be contracts separately flowing in from uh, Ministry of Defence for the space players. And while I say that, I must also mention that uh, there is no clear distinction between a civilian technology and a military technology <laughs> anymore. So, so that means the commercial ecosystem that we are talking about, uh, it will benefit from both the ends. So, uh, contracts should be galore from both the sides. Um, and I expect there should be a strategic document in the making. If not now, but at least in the next uh, 5 to 10 years. 
would you say the uh, way in which the space um, programs of various countries are progressing, the military aspect is now going to dominate or even overtake, uh, you know, civilian uh, aspects? I mean, you have even the U.S. laying claim to the parts of the moon, you know, and uh, the, that kind of competition could play out in a very uh, uh, military fashion. Yes, well, yes and no is my answer. Uh, so, I, I'm actually stuck in a dilemma how to answer this. But uh, what I can say is, uh, look, when any country puts out large number of assets anywhere in the world, be it expeditionary assets placed on in other countries or be it assets that are placed in outer space or in the global commons, in the open waters or in Antarctica or the Arctic, the security of these assets is also a priority. Now, whom are we securing these assets from? So we are securing these assets from adversarial countries, maybe non-state actors. We are protecting them from uh, natural hazards. It could be earthquake, it could be a storm, or it could be anything. Very similarly, when you place an asset or large number of assets in outer space, the security of those assets uh, become very critical. So that becomes a justification. So I won't say militarization of space is uh, something that is run away, but securitization of space is something that I am uh, am confident about. That mm. will uh, happen because uh, your your economic security then gets uh, complete uh, linked with the security of these assets. Uh, I'll give you a, a, a one scenario that will set up a good example. That imagine if. Uh, your telecommunication satellites, as mundane as telecommunication satellites that are beaming data to you, uh, they go kaput. What sort of economic damages are we looking at? Yeah. We are looking at cascade effect uh, in terms of uh, broadcast damages, then the broadcasting fees will go uh, uh, topsy-turvy, then the sponsorships, the revenues that are coming from advertisements, everything will go topsy-turvy. And this will have a really uh, a cascade effect of sorts. Uh, so you wouldn't want to be in that sort of a scenario. And that's why security becomes a major issue. And as I said, by security, I'm not meaning military security, but uh, it could be security of any uh, sorts. So last question, we now have a vision document. Do you expect now the nuts and bolts? How does that come to play? Do you require an act of parliament? I mean, uh, what do we see uh, going forward? So, uh, there is a draft space activities bill, uh, which is uh, under consultation since the past few years. It hasn't seen the light of the day. Uh, so, the per perhaps the government would want to start that ball rolling, that there needs to be an activities bill tabled. Uh, the ecosystem will have to find uh, friends in the parliament. Hmm. Uh, a lot of discussions will have to happen. You know, uh, there will there should be a, a interest group uh, in the parliament of the parliamentarians that need to be catered to. Uh, there can be a cabinet committee on it. Yeah, so there are many possibilities even within that ambit. So cabinet committee is one possibility. Uh, maybe a, a caucus of sort uh, can be created. Although caucuses are not uh, uh, quite endemic to the Indian uh, parliamentary system, hmm. but we can move in that direction and particularly we'll have to start sensitizing the parliamentarians what is exactly needed so economic keeping economic interest national interest and security interest all uh, tightly in balance, yeah. linked with each other mm -hmm. in balanced so that is the next step and uh, the the number of activities that we are seeing uh, they are so humongous one bill might not suffice nice <laughs> so but Perhaps there has to be a bill on uh, orbit, on the orbital operations. There has to be a separate bill on how, uh, uh, separate legislation on how uh, should you launch a particular vehicle. Uh, uh, what what are the what are the safety measures? Uh, uh, what are the contingencies? Uh, what are the compensations if there are any damages? There there will have to be a bill on insurances. So, we are really getting into the thick of it. Mm -hmm. And since you mentioned that, 
I mean, I'm just trying to look at the uh, uh, the skilled personnel who will be required across the range of you know civilian and military uh, domains. I mean, are we uh, anyway near uh, you know um, building the infrastructure for that kind of uh, uh, for that kind of people for that kind of expertise? We are unfortunately not. So uh, some 15 years ago. Uh, the Department of Space had established Indian Institute of Space uh, Science and Technology in Kerala. Yeah. And that's the own uh, university which is training uh, the workforce for the space sector. But one university wouldn't suffice for a country as large as India. Yeah. So you would need multiple universities to come into the fold. Uh, some of the IITs have started setting up new departments. So, for instance, I very well know that IIT Kanpur uh, has a dep uh, now a department of space and astronomy. Same with IIT Indore. But uh, again, the intake capacities of these IITs is quite low. So, uh, you will have to churn up programs through AICTE or through uh, technical universities to really proliferate programs where you need large or you can generate large manpower that could be supplied to the industry. So you could have certain courses for telecom, could have certain courses for earth observations, uh, for building sensors um, and whatnot. So you, you need to do much more uh, when it comes to education and when it comes to uh, human resource generation. So uh, many, many obstacles ahead and uh, many milestones to be achieved. Uh, Chaitanya Giri, thanks very much as always. Great talking to you. Same here, Surya. Thank you so much. And for those of you who followed us on this conversation, uh, do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter and other social media. Thank you and good night.